Father, we thank you for your mercies towards us. We thank you that we can be here on the Sabbath in quietness and peace so far. The world is rapidly changing, and no one knows how long that peace is going to last. Help us to redeem the time. May we recognize that we should use the hours that we have to understand your will for us. May we make decisions that will not be reversed. May we move forward by your grace, and may we know that you've made a place for us. Help us to recognize that this isn't just about us. There are all kinds of people out there who don't know. Over 5,000 didn't get to go home on September the 11th, and they never thought that's the way it was going to be. Only you know who made their decisions for you in time. Help us to sense that we have something to do in this world to warn people, to help them understand that there are things they need to decide. Help us to have it clear in our own minds. We thank you for this time today. May your spirit guide us and instruct us. May we learn something that we need to know. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Okay, I have two questions here. I don't know if this is... Okay, maybe I'll deal with this a little bit too in that one. All right, we'll start with the questions today before we get into our subject. Now, we're going to end a little bit early because they're going to be using the church here at 5. So we want to be done with our meeting before then. Okay. Uh, looks like this is a multiple question. In regards to situation ethics, thou shalt not kill. God tells Israel to slaughter other nations. Okay, now, I'm going to ask you a question. You see, whenever you have a question in your mind, you ought to be able to work up some other questions around it that can help clarify what it is you're asking. This is one of the reasons that God tells us to pray and pray and pray and pray. He knew what you said the first time. Why did he tell you to keep praying? You didn't know what you were asking the first time. <laughs> and so God says you keep asking and asking and asking and asking. And finally you're going to figure out what you're saying. <laughs> it's one of the ways that God educates us. He makes us use our mind. <laughs> All right. So the same with questions. When you ask a question, it's a good thing to have questions. But keep asking questions around it. Use your mind. See where it goes. I'm going to ask you a question now on top of this one. Can you disobey a commandment of God by doing what God tells you right now? Can you disobey a commandment of God, one of the Ten Commandments, by obeying God when He talks to you, no matter what He says? Okay, now think about that for a moment. How does that bear on this question? When God told Israel to eradicate a nation, could they be disobeying one of the commandments? It's impossible. So this kind of a question is answered by understanding what it is we're asking. There are... I want to be careful how I say this. When God tells us to do something, we are to obey Him no matter what is written down any place. We are not to use our brain to say, God, you're telling me wrong. <laughs> Israel was a theocracy. And as such, they were a nation under his guardianship. And when he told them to do something, as a nation, that's what they did. The United States is not a theocracy. Russia is not a theocracy. China is not a theocracy. There are no theocracies on this planet anymore. No nation can say, we are doing what God said. Because God isn't talking to them directly as nations anymore. Only Israel. Now, God can talk to individuals. 
And that's what he does. But today we need to be very careful that we follow the word of God. We are not allowed to go around killing people because God said, you kill somebody. We are not a theocracy. <laughs> so what was okay for Israel is not okay for us as individuals. So don't try to mix the two. When God talks to Israel, it's as the supreme ruler of the nation. When he talks to an individual, it's always on the basis of the word, what we can all of us understand here. He's not going to tell somebody to go kill somebody today because there's no way of checking that or testing it. How does the person know? That was really God talking. You know, the people who were flew those airplanes, I don't know if you have read the comments that are written down by the one named Atta. He apparently was the leader of the group. And he told them, when he wrote in Arabic, what you are doing, your, they didn't, he didn't use the word natural, but yourself, you're going to find it difficult to want to follow through. But you have made a decision before God to do this. So you need to keep appealing to God to give you strength to follow all the way through. Appeal to God. That's what he said. And so he said, when you reach the airplane, when you step in, you pray to God and you say, I'm doing this in your will. I appeal to you to help me. You go into the airplane, you sit down and you pray. You pray that you will be pure and clean so that you may follow the will of God. And know that when you have been obedient, paradise is waiting for you. Pray. He says the night before you do make your preparations, you must have a clean shirt, clean trousers, and your shoes must be clean. I mean, this was all for God. <laughs> In their minds. Now to us, the whole thing is horrible. What God were they talking about? <laughs> but the point is, they thought that God was telling them all of this. And so they killed. And to them, there's nothing wrong with it. Now, it's kind of hard to fault a person like that because they were willing to die for what they believed. How many of us here today are willing to die for what we believe? You think about that. Is there anything you would die for today? <laughs> they died. It's kind of hard to send that kind of a person to prison. But they were wrong. How do we know? They were wrong even according to the Quran. They believed a man instead of reading their own Bible. The Quran does not support what they did. All right. So each of us has something to think through here. Am I as serious as those men were even though they were deceived? In the spirit prophecy, there is a statement in Tsar of Ages that says that we are to obey God even unto death. That's part of the gospel. And you know, we can't do it if we haven't already decided to die. And we can't decide to die someday. We've got to decide right now to die. That's what Paul means by dying to self today. Now, Ellen White says it this way. The living is easy after you're dead. <laughs> so, the hard part about being a Christian when people are struggling all the time is the death has not been decided. We've got to decide that death. 
And once you de you decided it, well, what else can anybody do to you? <laughs> Doesn't Paul say in Romans 6, when you're dead, you are freed from sin. Yeah, dead people don't have a problem with sinning. <laughs> yeah, Romans the sixth chapter. People who are dead are freed from sin. And again, Alan White tells us the reason we have so many problems in the church, she didn't say in the world, in the church, is we have been burying people alive. They never died to sin. That's the reason we have problems in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. There are people in the church who never died to sin. Most of them were not even told they needed to be. They were just told to be baptized because they believed in the seventh day and tithing. Romans 7, uh, excuse me, Romans 6, you know how that chapter begins, the first two verses. How shall we that have died to sin continue any longer therein? Who's the we? The we is Christians. Everybody else. If, you, if we can't say those verses, we better find out why. Now, I'm just hitting the top of this because we don't have time to talk about this in detail, but I want you to understand something. You are not going to obey God to your satisfaction ever. So if you're waiting for that day, you have a major problem. It's never going to happen. The only way you will ever satisfy God is when you finally turn it over to Jesus and say, by faith, I am complete in Jesus Christ. The Father's happy with the merits of Jesus. We've got to get over to the place where faith is operating and we're only looking at Christ, not ourselves. All right, so this is the good question here. Situation ethics is something Christians don't do. We cannot apologize. For sin. There's no excuse for sin. But because God did tell somebody to do something, let's not turn that into a sin. He can't sin. What he did was right. Why did he tell them to kill those people? All right, there's lots of good reasons. You can hit a couple of them here. The biggest thing that I think involved in this question is that the people of God are what God is protecting. He does not protect lost people. That's a hard thing for us to get a hold of. God doesn't owe anybody anything. Not a single thing. <laughs> we are saved through Jesus Christ because God loves us, but he doesn't owe us. He could snuff everyone out in the whole human race and be absolutely just and no angel could ever say he did something wrong. He doesn't owe us, but he loves us. And because he loves us, he even paid the price of sending his own son to die that we could have eternal life. Only love makes that work, nothing else. We have no claim on God. We can't tell him, you need to do this because. No way. <laughs> you know, when we go looking for God, what has happened first? God came looking for us. We only start looking for God after we're responding what he's doing already. No human wants to know about God. No one. Naturally. Humans are the natural friends of Satan. 
I think we need to understand some of this because every human you meet out there on the streets has a problem if they don't have Jesus Christ in their life. It's the same problem those people had who were piloting those airplanes. So this is a beautiful question. This goes lots of directions. Remember that David ate showbread. That was against the law. As a matter of fact, God said if anybody ate that showbread except the priests, they were to be stoned, they were to be killed. That was the law. How come David got away with it? Because God had given him a command and he was obeying God. In the exercise of that obedience, he ate the showbread. He could not commit sin against God's commandments if he was keeping a commandment. <laughs> and Jesus asked the scribes that very question. He said, how is it? David ate the showbread <laughs> because they didn't understand these things. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of things going on here, but I think that's enough on that. We want to remember that when God commands a nation to be taken out, there's a good reason. It's a righteous reason, and it's to protect his people. All right, second part. What about Adventists and the armed forces? History of the Seventh-day Adventist conscientious objectors. That's a little more involved. Let's just say this. The Seventh-day Adventist denomination does not set down rules for its members in matters of conscience. How would you like it if the Seventh-day Adventist church told you, you have to be a tithe payer in the church that you attend or you can't be a member. How would you like that? No law like that's going to come from the General Conference because it's against the Scriptures. Tithing is a conscience thing. And it's between the person and God. See? And so is going to war. This church cannot tell you you cannot pick up a rifle because it's not in the Bible that you can't pick up a rifle. But if you are a true Seventh-day Adventist following the teachings that God has revealed to this people by conscience, you will understand it's wrong to kill. God has not commanded me to kill an enemy of America. And America doesn't have the right to tell me to kill an enemy of America. Because that enemy might be my brother Christian. <laughs> Do you know that in the Arab world there are thousands of Christians? They're not all Muslims. <laughs> Yeah, and suppose one of them is forced to pick up a rifle or they shoot their family. And you have a rifle. And here's two Seventh-day Adventists aiming rifles at each other. That's kind of weird, isn't it? <laughs> so for conscience sake, a true Seventh-day Adventist will not pick up a rifle to kill somebody. But the church can't tell them, you better not. It's a matter of conscience. Now, when this first came up, it was in the Civil War. Yeah, that was really brother against brother, wasn't it? In the same house. <laughs> Civil War. That was a terrible thing that happened in this country. But you know... There were Seventh-day Adventists back then. And James White put out a review and herald on the subject of going to war in the Civil War. And Abraham Lincoln had instituted a draft. And the only way you could get out of that was to pay $300 and have somebody take your place. 
And so James White, in this first article that came out, said, you know, if they draft you and you resist and they shoot you, you really sold out pretty cheaply as far as your life is concerned. He said, they draft you. You go. <laughs> and that's where he left it. And let me tell you, the Adventists jumped all over him. <laughs> they said, hey, it says, you, thou shalt not kill. Well, he never said anything about killing. He was talking about the draft. He said, we will not be drafted. We'd rather be shot. Well, who was right? <laughs> Ellen White didn't say anything for a while because she didn't have any light on it. God hadn't talked to her yet. But James White was out there trying to say things to calm things down. And finally, Ellen White got a hold of some good information from God. And she said, you know, you people have criticized my husband. He was doing the best he could with the best information. I didn't have any light on it. And I believe his position was right based on what he understood. She says, but I do have some light now. God has talked to me and he has shown me what, what's really going on in this world. She says, Europe is watching us very carefully, killing each other off. And England and France and all of them are just waiting to come over here and finish us off. <laughs> God showed her that. And I have since found documentation that says that very thing. She said some other things. But the important issue here is that when she was all done with it, she said, God has shown me enough that we realize we must have nothing to do with this unjust war. Nothing. Well, where did they put the Adventists? They're forking over $300 at a crack now not to be drafted. Now, $300, that was back then. Suppose today, let's say $50,000. Next week, Bush says, we're going to Afghanistan. And Adventists, you're going with the rest of us. You're Americans. It, but if you don't want to because you have conscientious scruples, and our country still honors conscientious scruples, we'll let you off for $50,000. And you get somebody else to take your place. Okay, John's name is the first name on the list. John, you're going to pay him $50,000? <laughs> you, you have 50000 in the bank? You know, what's he going to do? <laughs> you're going to get him <laughs> a bill. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what they did in those days. Because this was real. This came up. This was a reality. Man's name came up. These people were farmers. There were no rich ones among the Adventists, okay? These were farmers. Man's name came up. I said, okay, you're being drafted. What is it? You come in or is it $300 and you find somebody else? What's he going to do? Well, he didn't have it either. And so he went to the church and said, church, they've drafted me. Now what? And the church says, we'll pay for you. And the church gives $300. And then the next man in that church name comes up. So I have a problem. I say, well, we'll get the $300 together. <laughs> and this kept happening and happening and happening. And it didn't take very long before they realized we are running out of money. The whole church is running out of money. <laughs> Can you imagine if $50,000 at a crack today? A thousand member church? 500 men are called up? 500 times $50,000? <laughs> That's what was happening. And do you know why it was happening? This is all very interesting when I was studying this. The Civil War 
was over lots of issues. The northerners were just as much at fault as the southerners. It had to do with the economy of this country and it was based on cotton and slaves. There were just as many men in the north that wanted slavery to continue as there were in the south. And our own generals in the Union were giving information to the Confederate generals to keep things so that th this thing couldn't be won by the pro-anti-slavery uh, people, excuse me. It was a pro-slavery battle, and it took Lincoln a while to figure this out. <laughs> he finally began to see all this. <laughs> well, I'm not going to go through all that. The point here is we had conscientious objectors, and the church was losing its money. In the Review and Herald, the leadership of the Seventh-day Adventist Church said, we must pray for this war to end or we will cease to be a people. We will be a bankrupt church. The devil was trying to end Seventh-day Adventism. <laughs> he was using the Civil War in the way the Catholic Church used the Spanish Armada. You know what? The Seventh-day Adventist people fasted across the whole nation for three days and prayed. And in three weeks, the war ended. There's a lot of history that we need to get a hold of. This is all in volume one of the testimonies. If you haven't read this, you better get over there and start finding it. It's been there a long time. <laughs> There's just a lot of material in our books. So what about conscientious objectors then in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Today, the way it's generally handled is that if a person is drafted, they go, but as medics. And this has been a stand that the church can get behind and say, we will support this position as a church and say that our men are genuine, bona fide Seventh-day Adventists as medics in the services. They will heal anyone, enemy or a friend, what does make any difference. They're there for healing. And that seems to have been a position that uh, the brethren have gone along with. Okay, I'll get to that. That's good. All right, uh, one other thing. Oh, that's all on that one. Now, I have to say one more thing. Pride of opinion is a terrible thing. Religious pride of opinion will get a person lost forever. In the First World War, this issue came up. Denominationally, the draft came up. And the General Conference said, we can't tell you what to do. It's a matter of conscience. As Seventh-day Adventists, we can't support any killing. But we can't tell you what to do about the draft. It's between you and God. There were certain people in the denomination that didn't like that. They said, wait a minute. That's waffling. That's being weak need." You need to take a stand here and say, this is wrong, you will not be part of the war, no draft, no nothing, take the consequences. It was all black and white with them. And the conference said, we can't do that, we will not be conscious for anyone. A person has to see this for themselves, between them and God. And we can make our position clear that we don't want anyone to be out there killing, that's not what we believe. But we can't tell a person about draft. What they do about that, they have to decide. Well, the people who didn't like that said, you're a fallen church, and they left. And they became what's known today as the Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's why they left. They didn't like this idea about the church not legislating about being a conscientious objector. Well, my study leads me to believe they were wrong. That position they took 
is not biblical. But there are a lot of people out there who are very sincere, very conscientious, and uh, they can believe what they want, but I don't believe it has anything to do with Seventh-day Adventism. All right, that's all I'll say on that one then. There's another question here. Explain Amos 5, 8. Oh, it says the seven stars. Okay. Seek him that maketh the seven stars in Orion, turneth the shadow of death into morning, maketh the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, poureth them out upon the face of the earth. Jehovah is his name. All right. The seven stars. Seven stars here are what in those days the people thought they saw. If you will go to Job 38... Job didn't just see things, he was told things. <laughs> so we get more information. Job 38, verse 31. He's going to tell us what the seven stars are. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? Or loose the bands of Orion. See, there's the same two things again. So what appeared to be seven stars racing through the skies is what astronomers know as Pleiades. But they know now that it's more than seven stars. It just looks like seven stars. It's, it's just bunches of stars traveling to space all together. <laughs> and so Amos is, is uh, talking about that in the language that uh, people who just have eyes can deal with without the astronomy material. Okay, now, w when you try to dig stuff out like this, if you, you obviously, you can't know every verse in the Bible to figure these things out. Get a reference Bible of some sort. And with this kind of material, reference Bibles will lead you to other scriptures. And you will usually be able to track down some information. By the way, in uh, Amos 5.8, does anybody here have a reference? What does yours say? about the seven stars. Job. It does say Job. Okay, so it will lead you to Job. All right, good. So when you get into trouble, there are many times the references are useless. <laughs> I mean, there's just lots of references that really don't go anywhere, but there's some that do lead you in some places. Try them out. See what happens. Don't just throw it all away. <laughs> okay. We are to test all things by the scriptures. If I thought God told, told me something to do, will it not match the scriptures? Will it break a command? Well, first of all, we have the Ten Commandments. Those are basic. God will not tell me to lie. He will not tell me to murder. Which is what the commandment says. It doesn't say kill. It says murder. He will not tell me to do anything against those commandments as an individual. Now, he may have a whole group of people. Let's say a whole church. And he may tell the entire church to do something that appears to contradict his word someplace else. But when he tells a whole church, they will have a consensus that they are not violating the principles of Scripture. The Scripture is always the bottom line. But an individual doesn't have the right to say, I have heard the will of God against the church. That's what we have today. We have people stepping out saying, I will not listen to the church. The church is in error. God talks to me all by myself. That's wrong. I hope you never feel that way because you will find you're in a b very bad position when you are smarter than the whole church. God has never let that happen. Ever. Ever. 
So there are things that we ought to think through and also read Ellen White on these subjects. She has, says a lot about these things. I do not believe that if the, she was here today, the people who think they're reforming the church would stand without getting a testimony from her. Because she said a lot of things that are already in print showing that basically what many of them are doing is not from God. I'll give you just one page. Testimonies to Ministers, page 58. I'll give you two pages. And 22, she says basically the same thing on those two pages. On page 22, she says, Brother S. stood up. And he said, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is Babylon. He said, you cannot be a Christian in that apostate system. And she says, he is in error. This message does not come from heaven. Well, where is it coming from? Pretty clear to me where it's coming from if it's not coming from heaven. And there are all kinds of statements like that, and yet there are people out there putting out their papers and their videos and their tapes saying exactly the same thing. Well, I don't have to go ask what's going on here. I know the pages. <laughs> and you know, when I've quoted these pages to these very people, to their face, you know what they say? They all say the same thing. Yeah, all of them. They say, oh, that was back then. <laughs> and I tell them, yeah, it was back then, but it's today too. <laughs> we got his pen out here, he's writing. <laughs> we may not get to the, <laughs> the breastplate today. What is the word they use? Matthew twenty four fifteen. You know, I don't remember this. P P. There are two words in Matthew twenty four fifteen that you might look up. One is desolator, and the other is abominator. But I don't remember a P word. <laughs> Check with me later and see. Uh, that's not coming through to me. I might have said something that's not. I'm not remembering here. Okay. Oh, okay. I see what the question is now. That's good. All right. Still dealing with this same question about God talking to us uh, or even to a church. It says, hasn't the Catholicism done that? Said that God told us to do so and so even though it's not scriptural. Yeah, that's a good point. They have gone to something else beyond scripture. They're not saying God told me specifically. And they have not said he told the church specifically. The Catholics hide behind something else that shows it's an error. They say God told the Pope. And they have a thing called magisterium. That the Pope cannot err when he is dealing with scripture ex cathedra. And of course everything he says is going to be ex cathedra in terms of scripture. <laughs> but the whole point comes down to one man. And God never says in the Bible anywhere to pay attention to one man only and make that the will of God if it's against the Bible. So the Bible is always the test. It's not going to change for this day. The Bible has to be the supreme test. Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists have a problem. Let's get away from everybody else. We know they have problems, but we have a problem. There are people in our midst who think that when Ellen White says something, no matter what it is, they're going to believe it, even if they never know what the Bible says about it. That's a problem. 
God never told us to believe Ellen White first and then the Bible. He told us to believe the Bible and then Ellen White. When we get that turned around, we're just like the Catholics. So you didn't ask that, but that's the next one. <laughs> so we have a problem. There are people in our church who do that. They have the vaguest idea what the Bible says. But because Alan White says it, that's it. Well, they don't know. She said, don't do that. <laughs> do you know why Alan White was given the spirit of prophecy? Because we wouldn't study the Bible. Yeah. Why did Moses write the first five books? Because the people of Israel would not obey God. So all these things are there because of disobedience. <laughs> if we would obey God, we'd be in a whole different place with regard to all these writings. We wouldn't be beating each other over the head with pages. <laughs> Yeah, when people pull out the books and say, well, here on page so-and-so it says, so you better do that. I want to know, are they doing it? <laughs> and the fact that they're beating somebody over the head with it means they aren't. There's a lot that they don't know that are also in those books. Now, because God gave us the books, we should take it as a blessing. Because we're so ignorant, we really need them. There's so little. We really do understand. When we read the book, it's a whole new thing we never thought about. <laughs> it shouldn't be that way. Those books should say to us, well, look at there. That's what I know. I know that's the truth because I have that. And it says it in the book. So now the two of you are in total agreement and you can say, praise God, here it is in the book. But if we are constantly running into things we never heard about and never thought about and have the slightest idea about, we need to question, do I know my Bible? <laughs> yeah. Seventh-day Adventists have a problem of tradition, just like the Catholic Church, and we don't need it. There's only one way we're going to stand in the last days. And Alan White has told us in Great Controversy, She says, unless we know the Bible, we will be swept away by the delusions. We better get back to the scriptures. Alan White never disagrees with the scriptures. I believe Alan White is the voice, not Alan White, but the spirit of prophecy through Alan White is the voice of God talking to us. Those are the most valuable writings this planet has aside from the scriptures. We need to hang on to that. But don't turn it around and never look at your Bible. Okay, good. That's, that was another good question. We need to clarify that. All right. We have time to maybe do a couple of these, so let's do them. Last time... Golden breastplate on the priest, high priest. And I'm going to ask you to use your minds and not your notebooks. Who was the first tribe that we started with? Good. We're going to go through all 12 this way. Who is the next tribe? <laughs> okay. It's a car. And who is the third one? We only did three last week. Now, before we're done, you're going to be able to do all 12, just like that. All right, same with me. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Judah, Issachar, Zebulun. Okay, you say it. Judah? You got it, see? 
<laughs> That's all you have to remember. Now, when you want to remember something, don't write it down on a piece of paper and look at it and then try to memorize it. Just say it. <laughs> yeah, you get it in your head that way. And repeat it a few times and you'll have it. You know, when I was reading the latest material that uh, came to me from about Abraham Lincoln, this man, who didn't have a lot to do with schools, I think he had about three months' worth, <laughs> but he was a reader. When he was in school, they said, this man will never amount to anything. He is so slow. <laughs> That's what the people said about him. Just slow, he doesn't get anything the first time around. But they didn't understand him. This man would not leave a subject until he had it totally mastered. And so he would look at something, and he'd look at it again, and he'd mull it over, and he'd work with it, and go over it. And I'm sure he talked to himself too. But... He would not leave the thing until he had it down cold, and then he'd go to something else. And that's how he lived his life. When he became a lawyer, it's the same. He got a couple books, and he started at the beginning, and just and he'd pour over it and think about it. What he didn't understand, he'd work with it and work with it. Finally, he'd figure that out, and then he'd go to the next, the next. I mean, he agonized over things for hours and hours and hours. But he turned out to be Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so, you know, this is not being funny, St. Judas and Zebulun. You'll have it. Nobody can ever take it away from you once you do it. But if you don't do these things, you're not going to remember anything. <laughs> we have to put in a little bit of effort. All right. So, you've got it. This will not leave you. Say it when you go home. Don't look at anything. Just say it. Judah is a Kazebulon. Judah, you can engage your brain later. Just get it in there. <laughs> okay. Judah is a Kazebulon. Now the next one. What? Stones. Yeah. We, we, I want to ask you to do the stones right now. We'll do the stones another time. Don't want to overload the brain. There's one thing. H.M.S. Richards one day, who was probably one of the best preachers the denomination has ever had, he was really something. He had 8,000 volumes in his garage. That's where his office was in Glendale. <laughs> 8,000 books. And he knew what all of them said. He was like Abraham Lincoln. He would read and study. He, do you know that... H.M.S. Richards was blind in one eye and he couldn't see in the other one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He would read books with his one, one good eye. The, the other one was gone. He, just, he only had one. He'd read books like this. <laughs> yeah. And if you didn't know that, whenever he would preach... And he preached to thousands and thousands of people all at one time. He was just a fantastic preacher. He preached at the General Conference. He preached at everything this church ever did. The 1919 Bible study group. I mean, he was always there. They always asked him. And you know, he always did this when he was preaching. And of course, nobody knew. He couldn't see the page at all. He was just quoting from memory. <laughs> and he would do entire sermons like that. He said, over here in Matthew 4, it says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And he says, and that goes along with First John. <laughs> he never saw a word. <laughs> but that almost got him in trouble one day. In Michigan, he was walking around, reading, and he hit some ice and went down, fell on his back, and while he was on his back with the Bible, our book still in his hand, he said, Richards, you're through. 
there he was, standing, laying on. But I am amazed that in all the years, because that's the way he always walked. He never walked without a book on his eye. I'm amazed he didn't fall in a hole someplace. Because <laughs> he couldn't see where he was going. He just always walked. I could tell you stories about a lot of the people in this church who have been real preachers and real teachers. We've had some tremendous individuals in this church. Get your way to God. Oh, <laughs> I can't go through that right now, but thank you. We'll try to come into some of this. Brother Elijah here has a penchant for taking words and breaking them down and making sentences out of just a word. And someday I may ask him to come up here and, and give you some examples of that so you see what he does because it really is interesting. But I, d I don't understand it enough to go through this. So I'm going to wait until you do it. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next one here is Reuben. And I won't do any more than we're going to get through today. We're on abbreviated time anyhow. All right. Now, you'll notice that the way the stones are, they're not coming out according to the way they were born. But this is according to the way God set up the tribes to march. Okay. So the lead tribe was Judah whenever they followed the pillar. And then it's the car and Zebulon. And there were articles of furniture in between. All right. So we're not discussing all of that right now. We just want to see why the order is this way. And for those who may not have been here before, we're beginning number one here because that's the way the Israelites would do it. They read from right to left. That's the way their language is. They didn't do it the way we do, the other way around. So we're doing it this way, the way it would be on the breastplate. And we're discussing the stones also. All right. So let's look at um, Reuben. We're a little more familiar with him because so, he's the first one on the list. Genesis 29. Now, you remember what's going on here in this family. Jacob was tricked into marrying Leah. And that set up a whole bunch of problems here. And Leah is really feeling the brunt of this, thinking, boy, I'm never going to have a husband because all he wants is Rachel. In verse um, 32... Let's see, where am I? Genesis 29, here we go. This is Leah conceived. And we know a little bit of the background here. Rachel was the one that should have had the first child, but here it's Leah. She bare a son, and she called his name Reuben. A see, a son. And we know what that must have meant to Rachel, see. A son. So he's the first one. In Genesis 49, verse 3, we see what uh, Jacob makes of this and the blessings. Genesis 49, verse 3. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength. So it sounds like he's pretty proud of him at first year. Reuben was the first one. The son of his strength, his power as a man, going through Reuben. The excellency of dignity. The excellency of power. And then you can almost hear his voice cracking as he says the next part of it. Unstable as water. Oh, <laughs> Reuben. The excellency of power, unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. That's it. Thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed. 
Then defilest thou it. He went up to my couch. He dishonored his father, his mother, the family, everything. There's not much more to say. He said, You're, you are not going to excel. Deuteronomy 33. Verse 6. Now this is Moses giving a blessing to the tribe. And even though Reuben as an individual did that and he was told he would not excel and there's a prophecy there about the tribe also, Moses adds something. He says, let Reuben live. He says, let him live and not die and let his men not be few. So he's saying, you may not excel. Jacob already said that. But at least you shouldn't be lost for eternity. Let Reuben live. <laughs> so we have to follow along now and see what's going on. These are the verses we have to work with. Now, Leah said something very important. She said, when the Lord saw my affliction. So God's looking. He's paying attention. She's going to say something else when the second one is born. She's going to say God heard. But for right now it's just God saw. <laughs> All right, so God saw my affliction. Let's go to Deuteronomy 21, verse uh, 15. This thing about Leah may be confusing to some people because it bears on the first question we dealt with today. If a man have two wives, one beloved, and another hated. Oh, well, that sounds familiar. <laughs> and had borne him children, both the beloved and the hated. And if the firstborn son be hers that was hated, then it shall be when he maketh his sons to inherit that which he hath, that he may not make the son of the beloved firstborn before the son of the hated, which is indeed the firstborn. But he shall acknowledge the son of the hated for the firstborn by giving him a double portion of all that he hath, for he is the beginning of his strength. The right of the firstborn is his. Well, we seem to have a problem here. Reuben did not get the firstborn blessing. <laughs> but in the writings of Moses, it says that no one had the right to take it away from him. So if people want to see contradictions in the Bible, maybe we found one. But there are no contradictions in the Bible. The contradiction is only in our brain. <laughs> We're just not understanding what God's doing here. Let's go to First Chronicles 5. And this is an interesting chapter. We'll probably come back into this chapter several times in the course of what we're doing. Verse 1, it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn, well, it says he was the firstborn here, of Israel, for he was the firstborn. But, uh-oh, here's a but. But for as much as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright, was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel, and the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. For Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Well, what's going on here? We know what happened. 
We know what Moses said. But God is overruling something here. The birthright was a double portion. And Joseph got that. The double portion was Ephraim and Manasseh. They're the ones who make it into Revelation 7. Okay. So the birthright was given to Joseph. The kingdom was given to Judah. All the kings came from Judah. And of course Jesus came through that line. And the priesthood was given to Levi. So all the things that Reuben was to have had were given away. They weren't taken from him. He lost them himself. He gave them away by doing what he did. He was kind of like his uncle. You remember his uncle? Uncle Esau. <laughs> same family. <laughs> same kind of thinking, same kind of character. Then what did Esau do? He had the birthright, didn't he? <laughs> He must have really got something great for giving away his birthright. What did he get? <laughs> lentils. <laughs> now, I like lentils, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. For a momentary gratification, he gave away his eternal birthright. Was that a pretty good trade? We can see it, can't we? How lousy a trade that really is for that little instant of gratification and eternity gone. Do we ever do that? Oh. It's pretty dumb, isn't it? Stop to think about it. This should be the other way around. We should be able to say, hey, I will keep my eternity and get rid of that little momentary gratification. I don't need it. <laughs> so we've got to get our heads on right. Thinking is only part of it. We need to ask God to help us with this because we are so prone to doing it wrong all the time. We need to ask Him to really get our hearts in the right place, to get over there to see Christ and what He's done for us. And to ask God for the strength to keep in a proper spiritual place. Okay, but all these little stories are telling us something. These boys and then the tribes. And we see something very important. Reuben here. He lost all the eternal birthrights. They're gone. For that one moment. But you know, when Jacob said, you are my firstborn, my strength, my power went through you. You didn't develop it, but it was in you anyhow. What he was saying was, you blew it, but you're still my son. <laughs> still my son. And one of the tr gates is going to have his name on it. <laughs> So God must have other people like that. <laughs> Who he says, you know, you really did blow it. <laughs> but you're still my son. Let's see why. There's something going through this story as we look about it, at it here. He was unstable as water. And his tribe, we see later on, had some of his same characteristics. One of the weaknesses of this type of personality is they always want to control somebody else. Yeah. But they can never really control anybody else because they are out of control themselves. <laughs> no one should want to control somebody else if they're out of control. <laughs> so this is one of the problems here. We must learn to control ourselves first. Moses said, live. Live. You lost a lot of things, but don't lose your life. Think about it. 
Don't lose your life. You're not going to flourish. But you don't need to perish. Okay. Don't need to perish. Well, we know some things about uh, Reuben. The one thing we might want to remember here, we don't, don't want to be too rough on him because he is one of the gates and it's something that can be overcome. But Reuben did have an excellency in him and it shined forth on one occasion. The boys decided to kill Joseph. <laughs> yeah. They didn't like it that the father saw excellency in him. <laughs> So they decided they had the chance. They're going to kill him and get rid of this pest. Their own brother. And we aren't there yet. So the next one, Simeon. But it was Simeon who said, let's kill him. Simeon was cruel. And we'll see more when we get to him. But he had a brother that was just like him. Levi. <laughs> Levi and Simeon had the same character. They always did the same things. But Simeon always got there first, it seems. <laughs> and Levi was right next to him. We'll see what that means in a little bit. We're not talking about them yet. But Joseph said, No, no, we can't kill him. He stood up for Joseph. He said, We can't kill him. Let's just put him in, in a hole and <laughs> scare him. <laughs> and of course, we know what happened when, when he was gone. They sold Joseph to a slave group and off he went. And when Reuben came back to get Joseph, he wasn't there anymore. <laughs> and he said, what happened to Joseph? <laughs> I said, oh, we sold him. <laughs> we sold him to who? <laughs> oh, a caravan came through here. They needed another slave and they paid good money for him. He's on his way to Egypt. <laughs> no more Joseph. <laughs> I says, oh, what am I going to tell Father? <laughs> You're going to tell him what we're going to tell him. He got killed. <laughs> but Reuben tried to stand up. It was too late. He didn't pay attention to what was going on. So there was something in him that wanted to do the right thing. The tribe. What about the tribe? We know a little bit more about the tribe as we go through. When they finally reached the promised land, the tribe of Reuben was the first one to ask for land. They said, we want this piece. But it was on the wrong side of the Jordan. <laughs> and so Joshua said, well, you can have that piece, but you have to come with us first. We've got enemies to fight over there. After we're done with them, then you can come back over here. And he said, well, all right, we'll do that. But you know, he was the first one to also go into captivity. He was out there on the outer edges. And when the Assyrians came through, they, they got Reuben first. There are some interesting people in their group. None of them sterling characters. Uh, they, I don't think there were any judges in that tribe. I haven't found a prophet from that tribe. No heroes. They didn't excel. But they had some people we can remember. Dathan and Abiram. <laughs> yeah, we know those names. They couldn't get it out of their system. They were the firstborn. They should be up there too. <laughs> See? And they said, the leadership God has established, we don't accept. We're just as good as them. We'll be leaders. I don't think they're a good example for anybody talking against the leadership that God's established. Uh, it amazes me how some of our people listen to people who talk like that. Yeah. And even agree with them. Bad news! You know, even David, he was out there and he was running away from Saul and he thought he needed some protection. He didn't ask God to protect him. He went over to one of those kings, the heathen kings. He said, these people will take care of me. Saul's not going to come over here. 
Well, he didn't ask God. He was using his brain instead of asking God. And we shouldn't do that either. We shouldn't use our brain without asking God. <laughs> we should use our brain, but only to hear what God's saying. <laughs> well, he got over there, and of course, he forgot he was famous. <laughs> Yeah, his pictures had been on all the boards everywhere. And they looked at him and said, Isn't that David? <laughs> and the king said, Is that David? And uh, oh boy, I'm in trouble here. So he started scratching the walls with his nails and foaming at the mouth and jumping around acting like a nut. And they said, No, that's not David. <laughs> he acted like a fool. But do you know the message he was carrying to those people? He was saying, we have problems in the church. I can't handle them over there. I'm going to come over here. God, uh, uh, Alan White says that God was dishonored by David exposing the faults of God's people. Now, please get that in your mind. God was dishonored by him exposing the faults of God's people to those heathens. And I believe God is dishonored today when any individual says against the Adventist church, they really have problems. They're in apostasy. They're fallen. They're Babylon. They're, that's dishonoring to God. We need to get these things very clear in our mind. And when that person comes to us with their little thing that they want to say, we should tell them, hey, you better straighten yourself up. You do not have a message from heaven. Go away. We need to talk to people like that. And when they send their little papers in the mail, <whistles> the Spirit of Prophecy says when we listen to their little tales, we partake of their sin. When we listen, She says that a little more clearly when she's talking about gossip. She says, when the person brings their little tale about somebody and you listen, you are part of the reproach. We are to cut people off and say, hey, sorry, I don't want to hear that. <laughs> so that's a friend of mine. That's one of my brothers. That's one of my sisters. <laughs> cut it out. Leave it alone. <laughs> we are not to listen. Well, Reuben had some real problems here in his tribe. They were rebellious. They compromised. They had failure. Yet with all that, the gate is there. How come there's a gate for Reuben? Let's go to Judges. Let's see what he did. Judges 5.16. And we're talking about the tribe here. This is the story of Deborah and Barak. Greatest battle, greatest victory that the Israelites probably ever won. But it says something here about Reuben in verse 15. Down at the last part of the uh, clause, it says, For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Great searchings, great meditations of heart. They looked into their heart. And what did they find? They found their need. And they knew there was only one answer. Jehovah God was the only answer they could have. His mercy. And they found that mercy. And I believe that's why they're going to be one of the gates into the city. Because they searched their hearts. And so this kind of character has hope if they will search their hearts and let God deal with them. Well, we're running out of time here. What is the stone? There's not a lot 
to deal with here. Their stone is an emerald. We might make a couple of things out of that. Emerald, green, sea green. Reminds us the color of water, maybe restless water. <laughs> we have Reuben in here, water color. Unstable as water, he was told. But green is an interesting color all by itself. The color of faith, the color around the throne. You do a study on that for yourselves sometime. It's an interesting color. But we want to know that Reuben was the emerald. And I think what that stone is telling us is that after his searchings of heart, he achieved faith after all. And his color is the emerald green. The faith work. So if it worked for Reuben, it can work for all of us. Now, after we're done with the 12 tribes, you may be able to figure out about where you belong and what gate you might go through. But don't try to do it until we're through all 12. <laughs> You've got to hear all of them and see what they do. But with these four so far, you can see there's little bits of each one there for us, I think. <laughs> we can see, oh, there's a little bit of that in me, there's a little bit of that in me. But we have to see the real one when we're all done with this. Okay, are there any more uh, questions? That's all we're going to do with this today. We don't have time to start the next one. You have one? Okay. Okay, we have one more question and then we'll... We'll try to close here by 5.30. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in regards to what you just said about the tribes, we all have a bit of here and there. What will be the deciding fact that will tell us where we belong? <laughs> well, I can't tell you that. You will recognize more in one tribe. You'll, you'll see there's a deciding factor here for me that nobody else knows about because this is designed to speak only to us. Other people can't see it. We'll know what's going on inside, how we feel about things, how we relate to things. We'll be able to see, well, that character is the one right there. So I can't tell you for sure a uh, uh, detail, but you will know pretty much that this is the gate. And the interesting thing is that when we finally go through those gates, everybody has to go through one of the gates to get in. And so everybody will know which gate we're going through, but that's not a big deal because we'll know the gate they're going through too. <laughs> so there are no secrets. It's all levels out. This is all equal once it all happens. But I do want to say this since we're closing. We have a tradition that says the 144,000 are these 12 tribes. And the tradition says that it's only 144,000. But I want to ask you the question, and you just keep remembering the question. What gate is Martin Luther going to go through? How is he going to get in the city if he doesn't go through one of those gates? The Bible does not say there are other gates, just those 12. And if we insist on saying that only the 144,000 are going to go through those gates, I want to know how everybody else is getting in. If we mean the 144,000 are a literal number who are alive when Jesus comes and there's nobody else. I don't believe we can make that work. <laughs> All the redeemed have to go through those gates or they're not getting in. And if all the redeemed are going through there, 
That means they all have, of those 12 characters, they all participate in the 12 tribes, spiritually. And if they participate in the 12 tribes, they also participate in that number 144,000 somehow. Now, it is quite clear in the spirit of prophecy that the Seventh-day Adventists who are alive when Jesus comes are called 144,000. But there's one thing she doesn't say in all places about that. But she does say it in about two or three places. She agrees with the Bible when the Bible says these are the first fruits. So the people who are alive when Jesus comes are the first fruits. Who's the harvest? <laughs> it's all the redeemed who are dead have to be raised. Now, when the first fruits of the 12 tribes who are alive when Jesus comes are raised to be in the clouds and the redeemed are raised from the dead to be in the clouds. Do they all meet? That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Yeah. Yes, they go first, and then we meet them in the clouds, the live ones. But it says we all meet in the clouds. And then they all go to heaven together as one group. There's not two groups going. It's one group redeemed from the earth, from mankind. So, when they finally all come back to the earth, and the holy city is here, is there going to be two different groups? Ellen White does not use the terminology 144,000 when she describes the people who are around the throne of God. She says, first are those who have their white robes with red hands. Then there's this group. Then there's this group. But she never uses the number 144,000 in that setting. Why? Because the first fruits are not a factor anymore. All the redeemed are the twelve tribes. Well, that's true. In early writings, page 19, Alan White said that Jesus raised his arm and he said, No, only the 144,000 can go in here. Who was he saying no to? Well, on that page and on the page before, she said she saw white robes with red hands walking. That was one group of humans. And then she saw another group. And she saw some little babies. She saw all kinds of humans. But she says as they approached the temple. Who is approaching the temple? All the groups of humans. They have become one group. And as they start to go in, Jesus said... Only the 144,000 can come in here. Will any of the people with the white robes and the red hems be among that 144,000? That means people who died as martyrs. Yes, there are Adventists who have died as martyrs. There are others who have died as martyrs. So who did Jesus say, no, this is for the 144,000? The number of man in the Bible is six. Always. Man was made on the sixth 
day. So the number of man is six. When God puts another six with it, that's two times. When God says something twice, it is established forever. That's a Bible rule. Six plus six equals twelve. This is the forever number of man. Twelve. Now, that number 12 means the kingdom of men. The number 12 in the Bible means kingdom. So the kingdom of men becomes the number 12. 12 times 12, dealing with tens, 10 times 10 times, will get you out to 144,000. So this is the ultimate number of the kingdom of men. In Revelation 14, it says, These are they which were redeemed from among men. The 144,000 are redeemed from among men, mankind. This number six, then, is the number we need to pay attention to. It goes all the way over here. This is one man. This is all men. The full kingdom. 